Hello, Chris. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me. Chris Holmes, Equality and Human Rights Commission board member, holder of nine Paralympic gold medals, member of the London 2012 Games bid team, director of Paralympic integration for the London Games, member of the House of Lords. So, Lord Holmes, we're here today to talk about working in times of change, challenge and churn. Many people are feeling a bit windswept at present, reduced budgets, increased demand, pressure to do more with less. And the question is how to react to this. It can be tempting to put your head down and hope for the best, but I think it's still possible to move your agenda on forward and to make gains, even when it feels as though you might have a mountain to climb. So I'm hoping that today you can cast some light on how people can do this. After all, you spent 10 years pursuing the ambitious goal of transforming attitudes towards disabled people and your ambitions weren't confined to the UK. Your goal was worldwide transformation. Your launch pad was the 2012 Paralympics, which involved more athletes than ever before from many more nations. It generated record ticket sales and there were more broadcast hours than ever before for Paralympics. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Before we get into the detail of hearing your story, let's start with that change, challenge, churn. Does it have to be a problem or do you think there are advantages working in that kind of environment? I think it can always feel like a problem, but the reality is that's what life is. It's always been like that. But in the times we're living at right now, it absolutely is right front and centre for people. For a lot of us, when we think about the generation that perhaps our parents and certainly our grandparents had, things were very set, be it in terms of who you voted for, which groups you associated with, where you went to work, once you're in that job, how long you stayed in that job, things were pretty set. That's all gone, absolutely. We're in a time now of almost perpetual change. You see in every aspect of life, right down to the handheld devices that everybody has, things are moving at such a pace. That inevitably feels uncomfortable for us as humans. We're naturally small C conservative. We naturally want to have that certainty. But actually, if you want to really drive something, make something happen. Making something happen necessarily means making something happen by change. So it's understanding the environment, being very clear about the environment you're in, being very clear about the point you're trying to get to, and then working out how you fill that gap between those points. But making something happen is inevitably about understanding, appreciating, embracing, and operating within an environment of change it can really drive those opportunities because it's an environment where you have to. If you consider where a lot of organisations are now, particularly in the public sector, in the third sector, I fundamentally appreciate how challenging that environment is, but it means people are forced to think different to think how can we still make stuff happen if you consider the the EHRC itself massively reduced budget massively reduced headcount but we can still make a heck of a lot of stuff happen within that environment we've still got a big amount of resource and a lot of people across the country we can still make a lot of stuff happen so it's understanding that even if something's challenging even if you haven't got the money and the people you might necessarily want ideally you can still really make great stuff happen by being clear about the vision, being clear about what you're trying to achieve, and then it only then you attach the people and the resources to that challenge. Let's look at your story. Let's go back to 2003 when you became involved in the bid. So few people were on board then. Phenomenal to be lucky enough to get involved with something right from the outset. Absolutely, this wasn't getting it at the ground floor. We were in the basement at this stage. <laughs> we, we really had to build this thing from scratch. And a small group of us really believed that we could potentially, just potentially, bring the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games back to this country for the first time in 64 years. 
This was set against a backdrop of pretty challenging economics. We had a tiny budget for the bid, and even at the height of the bid, we had just under 100 people. For the majority of the bid, we had around 50 people. So 50 people believing, working towards potentially winning the Olympic and Paralympic Games bid back for Great Britain against a tough economic backdrop, against a media backdrop where pretty much nobody in the press believed that we could win. Quite the reverse, negative headlines throughout the whole of the bid and a public who were at best pretty sceptical about whether we could win and even if we did, pretty sceptical about the sort of games that Great Britain could put on. But that core of 50 people believed in it, stuck to it. It didn't matter about all of that negative press. It didn't matter that we knew there's a massive rump of public against what we were trying to achieve because as a team, we were committed, we were connected. We really believed that just maybe if we stick to it, we could potentially get a decision. So we all went to Singapore very much with that in mind. Listen to you talking, it sounds very much like um, like sometimes you see sports people talking on television, oh, I'm going to run my own race, I'm not going to worry about the other competitors. Do you think your sporting background helped you? I think it was an incredible supporting element to have there in so many ways, not least to know that it's possible to get a heck of a lot of work done in the day. When I was competing, the alarm clock would go up at 4.30 in the morning for morning training. I knew what it feels like to be committed to a plan, a vision, a program, and to stick to it. Yep, to keep considering it, to keep revising, to keep looking at it, to make sure you're on the right path, but providing all those things come back with the positive mm. answers to absolutely stick on it. That was incredibly helpful to me in the bid and in the planning phase, because as much as anything, it enables people to continue even if there's a lot of negativity and stuff which could otherwise knock you off your path. If you've got that vision, that path, that program, that plan, and you're sticking to it, you've got people around you, you can absolutely carry on. It's not even that the negativity even um, cuts in at all really, because you're so clear about what you're trying to achieve. It doesn't matter, because again, most of the people, be it in the press, who criticise you when you're an athlete if you don't perform, and that happened for some of my races, the people who criticise us in Bidco, the people who are being negative when we were planning the games, what do they know? <laughs> what have they done? You know, they can have that position, but if you're clear about what you're trying to achieve, stick to it, stick to it, ride on over all obstacles and finish the race you started. If you're trying to achieve something different, different is necessarily change. If you just want to float down the stream and continue with the status quo, you can potentially have a comfortable, easy ride. But if you want to make the difference, make a change, that is inevitably going to be uncomfortable. But from that discomfort, embrace it, love it. It's your best friend when you're trying to achieve something because that is a key driver to make stuff happen. And then whatever negativity is coming from the outside, from your critics, from the press, doesn't matter because you've had the vision, you've had the belief, you've built the team and you're committed to making it happen. So what were your goals? Having competed in four games, I really had a sense of what the opportunity was. Stars aligned for us potentially in London if we could get it right. I really believed we could do something incredibly special with the game. So I had key operational targets, key strategies, all of that stuff, you know, thousands of pages, all that stuff which it takes to do the games. But actually, boiling all that down to a very simple thing, the aim was to build a team to put on the greatest Paralympic Games ever. And I believed if we could do that, we could fundamentally shift attitudes towards an opportunities for disabled people. And that's what drove me every day 
for, without question, the hardest work I've ever done in my life, but worth every single second of it. When I started, 0% of people were prepared to say they were strongly likely to buy a ticket to the Paralympic Games. I knew we had to sell out. I believe we could sell out, but that was coming from a base where 0% of people were prepared to say they were strongly likely to buy a ticket. So how did you work on that then? What, were your, what was your strategy? It started absolutely from that vision and from that belief that we could sell out, that it was possible in London 2012 with a whole series of factors we could do this. No previous games had sold out or anything like it. The best anyone had got would be around 40%. But I believed we could, if we got it right, sell out. So we had a detailed ticketing strategy, as you'd imagine, mm -hmm. all of that. Very detailed marketing and communications plan, all of that. Massive use of all the media, not least web and new media, which can be extraordinarily powerful if tied into your overall strategy and deployed in the right way. But as well as all of that, as long as the daily drumbeat, I knew we had to have a massive moment because it's that attitudes thing again. We had to shift people's attitudes. We had to enable people to want to come to the games, to want to pay money to come to the games. And to do that, I believed we had to not only sell this thing a sensational sport, we had to enable people to feel the comfort which would enable them to have the confidence to come and be part of this. Not to come for worthy reasons, mm. not to come with the fear that they might say the wrong thing or they might be embarrassed or it's going to not be a great day and they're on eggshells the mm. whole time. This had to be something, I want to be there because this is going to be absolutely brilliant. So I figured we needed a massive moment to set that off. So I convinced the rest of the board that we should do International Paralympic Day at a year to go we should host it in Trafalgar Square, have all 20 Paralympic sports showcased in the square and get the UK and the world's media down there. We had Prime Minister David Cameron and Mayor of London Boris Johnson in a game of wheelchair tennis in front of the world's media. Picture of the day the next day in the Wall Street Journal, picture of the day in the Financial Times, broadcast around the world, broadcast around the country. I believed we needed that massive moment because through doing that, the next day, I put Paralympic tickets on sale. In the first two weeks, we shifted 1.1 million tickets. Wow. And I absolutely knew at that point a year out that, yeah, we could. We could, if we kept sticking to that, we could just sell out. And I think now we can look back, we can see that the Games were so successful. But I think many equality officers and other people who campaign for <coughs> equality in human rights often can see how their agenda fits neatly into other people's, but it's getting those other people to appreciate the added value. And I'm wondering if there was anything in particular you did to make those people who were most interested in the Olympics understand the added value. Yeah, I think that, that's a really key point. And it was always about taking the time to really understand the other person, the other organisation's perspective where they were at, why they were at that point, and through that understanding, being able to construct a dialogue which fitted with their world, rather than just coming to a corporate, coming to an individual and going, the Paralympics is gonna be great, come and get on board with this. That would have got us nowhere because it doesn't answer that crucial question of, so what? Mm. And that is, so often the question which any of this stuff has to answer there'd be no point in me going and having those discussions going it's going to be brilliant it's going to be the biggest ever or so what mm. it had to be really through understanding their world where were that where were their fears their concerns their pressures even sort of you know some of the biggest companies in the world are olympic sponsors mm. that doesn't mean necessarily they'll just go well, OK, we'll sponsor the Paralympics as well. If they haven't been involved with the Paralympics, they've got budgets, they've got targets, they've got pressures, like the rest of us. It was very much about getting into their world and enabling them through 
hours and hours and hours of discussions, connections, building relationships with these people to enable them to see the Paralympics through their lens, which we'd been able to create to tie it very much to where they were trying to get to and what their pressures were and how the Paralympics could help with that. But it's absolutely shoe leather time. <laughs> and it's worth, it's worth every step of that journey because there isn't any easy win. Because if this stuff was easy, you'd have had all the Olympic sponsors, Paralympic sponsors before, but never happened. You'd have had all the tickets sold before, never happened. But worth every step of that journey. The greatest thing about all of this stuff is there is no magic fairy dust. And that's the, that's the magic of it for me. There is no magic fairy dust. The media is obviously very important in terms of attitudes. Tell us about how Channel 4 became involved. It was a great process to to go through, I couldn't have imagined when I started my swimming career <clears throat> some years ago, <laughs> I couldn't have imagined that in the run up to 2012 we would have every UK broadcaster vying to win the rights to show the 2012 Paralympic Games, all of them putting serious cash bags on the table, all of them putting serious production plans on the table, and every broadcaster could have done a great job at games time, no question about that. What got Channel 4 across the line was their commitment to the essence of the thing, right from the moment that they would sign the contract if they won. Not just to cover the games at games time, but to mainstream Paralympians, Paralympic sport and the Paralympic Games into their flagship programming, not least Jon Snow's championing of it on Channel 4 News. Absolutely superb. But on all, you know, there was a Paralympic come dine with me across all of their roster of programmes. And a genius in their chief marketing officer and Dan Brooke, we put together a short film because again, as with International Paralympic Day in terms of tickets, I knew we needed another big broadcast moment just before the Games to drive even more spectators and more interest into this. So we spent over a year talking, discussing, debating, arguing about this marketing film. I think what we produced at the end of it is probably something that I'm most proud of from the Games. Meet the Superhumans, it's on YouTube. I wanted it to say, this is sensational top flight sport, but within that, I also wanted to get the message across, these are Paralympic athletes, they are at the top of their game. But also, disabled people are not different. There isn't a different world, a separate world of disability. They're people like you, people like me. And to get all that into a 90 second film with an absolutely fantastic, banging track, absolutely, it, every time that film goes on, it absolutely connects me back into all those discussions, those debates. And we put that on on July the 17th, 2012 at 9 p.m. We put it on simultaneously on 74 of the UK TV channels. Now, I've got to be honest, perhaps you're the same as me with this, Kate. Up until that point, I didn't know there were 74 <laughs> UK <laughs> TV channels. Apparently there are. <laughs> But to have that moment simultaneously, this film going out across all of the UK broadcasters, what a moment, what a seminal Paralympic moment to enable every person to understand the games are coming to town, these are your games, watch it on Channel 4, listen to it on Radio 5, get a ticket if you still can, be part of this, go to a live site in whatever way you can, connect with this because it's gonna be groundbreaking. And the viewing figures, you know, 12 million people for the opening ceremony, that's you know, six times more than Beijing. Channel 4 were a sensational partner and you see that going forward with their coverage of Sochi and they're committed right through to Rio 2016, another great part of the legacy, you know, the, the broadcasting legacy from what we were able to do in 2012. You said at the beginning that your goal was to change people's attitudes towards disabled people and doing that would improve disabled people's lives. Looking back on it now, was it a success? Were attitudes changed? Has the landscape actually changed? 
for others to judge. <laughs> but in the research that we did in the autumn post games, it was incredible how we had shifted the dial, both in terms of the quantitative and the qualitative research. It demonstrated that you can change attitudes and you can change some pretty deeply held attitudes and beliefs. It is possible. But what that research also showed was, as one would imagine, this was a major event in the summer of 2012 with a decent build-up. But imagine a lifetime of attitudes, beliefs, positioning that many people would have had. Mm. What the research showed was, though we had achieved that change, it was tentative. The Paralympic Games unquestionably showed us at our best, what we can be as individuals, what we can be as communities, what we can be as a society, as a country. But the DHI demonstrates equally a much darker side, a much darker slice of life going on simultaneously as the Paralympic Games. And those are the two things to hold juxtaposed to understand how difficult this thing is and how it does require nothing short of every single person at the right stage to get involved, to commit and to make a difference in the way they can. So we need to keep going then to try and shore up those changes that we think occurred. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a journey. We're, we're on a journey. The Games was, I hope for everybody, a fantastic staging pro post but it wasn't an end of itself or in itself, not at all. It was a staging post on a much longer journey. I believe we're on the right track, but there's still a long, long way to go. Because look, just at the employment stats, if there was true employment equality, there would be two million more disabled people in work, two million people today in work, two million people that we're wasting their talent on a daily basis. Again, going back to that sense of challenge, change and churn that you were talking about, even in the good times, not only should we not tolerate that, but we couldn't afford it as a nation. But when we look at where we are now, we absolutely can't afford to day on day waste that talent. We need to have everybody contributing, committed, connected, doing stuff. And I don't just mean work in the narrow frame there, people being able to be fulfilled, doing stuff, contributing. It's again back to everybody continuing to connect, continuing to do what they can because again I think it's very easy and utterly understandable for people to be cowed by the weight of the task or the feeling that it's all about structures and systems bearing down on us that are greater than us. Focus on what you can do as an individual, focus on what you can do when you connect with other individuals. We all understand how important legislation is, how important statutory obligations are, but if you don't have that attitudinal piece, the statute may get you very few steps, if any, down the road, really. It's a, this thing, we, we are born human, we are connected, we live in a social world. It's about attitudes, values, behaviours, how we connect, how we interact with one another. And it is absolutely no more complicated than if you can change the life of one individual for the better, then your time has been absolutely well spent. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. It's great to hear your story. Really impressive. I'm sure everybody will be really inspired. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.